All right, thanks, guys. All right, so all right, thanks, Mira, for the introduction. So, all right, so just uh, again, sorry, like I, I lead design growth product at Abel Forest, and she gave a like pretty cool introduction of Abel Forest already. So I just like skip the bearing history, but Abel Forest has been a intense journey so far, so fueled by rapid growth. But by the way, I just want to check. Can you guys hear me at the back? Because okay. there's a microphone here, I can just blast. All right, cool. So, Abel Forest has been driven by rapid growth for the past like two years. And I'm not really here to talk about our history and bore you guys with it, but I'd love to share a little on some like how we think about growth, right? In particular, a few mental tools that help us like think, how, how to approach how to run product design and growth together at the same time, yeah? And hopefully we can all take away something useful from this. So if we backtrack a little bit, right, as a designer or product person, we've all faced something similar before, right? So we do our research, we learn something pretty interesting about our users, identify a problem, right? And then we ideate a brilliant solution, and then we bring it up and get blocked, right? Why? Because we only have one small engineering team, so why work on this solution? We have a thousand other half big solutions like mine, right? So why would this drive revenue? Why would this drive user growth or anything metric that we care about? Right? And this is a perfectly valid question because as a product person or designer, we create value, not just for the user's success, but also to help businesses grow healthily. Yeah? And this is why it's super important for us to be able to think about growth in a structured way for us to make design useful in this regard. Right? And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So, so whether you're a startup or a corporate, the most fundamental question we ask ourselves all the time right, is, what is the highest impact area we can focus on now, given limited resources? And we can break this down into three really simple questions, right? which is just with anything in life where we want to strive for something, we want to clarify our goal. Right? And then the next step, we want to reverse engineer this goal into the key levels we can pull to influence that. Right? And then decide what to focus on. There's three really simple steps. And let's walk through that. Right? So the most important thing at the start is to define really clearly what people like to call a North Star metric. Who, have, who has heard of this term North Star metric? Right? So basically, North Star metric, is, it, it came from people who are sailing, right? When they don't have a compass, they, they point to that one star and use it to guide themselves. That's like the North Star, right? And that's true North. But in the, in the case of companies and growth, this is the one key metric that you align your team on to drive, right? And this is super important because when you have one key metric to reference to, it helps you compare ideas later apples to apples and it sets the foundation for how you reverse engineer this later on, right? So for example, a better for is very, very simple. It's just revenue. So we are driving revenue, but it doesn't have to be money related, right? Especially if you're growing something free, right? For MailChimp, it's an email marketing platform as a SaaS product, right? So MailChimp drives weekly active users. So what does this mean, right? So MailChimp's focus is a, is a free product, so it's driving adoption. And because it knows its natural frequency of usage is at least weekly. So if you're not using it weekly and you drop off, right, you're not considered an active user and you're not contributing to this business, right? So what they, what they track is weekly active users to make sure that they are growing the right numbers, right? So Airbnb, Marketplace, you track Liquidity like Knight's book at first. For Medium, it's a reader writer platform. Who has saw Medium before? A chance upon Medium articles on the internet, right? Mo a lot of people have. So it's a place for, you, for people to write content, consume content, and it focuses on like, quality content, right? And engagement with that. So you can measure what the engagement is, which is the amount of time spent reading on the platform, right? So this can form the key North Star metrics for your kinds of business, right? And to think about it, it's just a few principles need to be kept in mind. Right? It has to be tied directly to the value you're creating for your user and also directly to revenue. Right? Simple as that. So now we have our number, revenue. So you can ask yourselves, how do we grow this? How do we grow revenue? How do we UX the crap out of revenue? Right? But it's not so easy to answer because it's too broad. So what we want to do is to narrow it down and figure out what influences this number at a more detailed level, right? So, so take a better first, what we drive is revenue, yeah? So for 
an e-commerce platform. What we, what we do, like just with at any other company, right, is we go stage by stage, taking this output metric and reverse engineer this into its key inputs. Right? And at the very first high level, the easiest way to think about it is just what part of our revenue comes from new customers versus repeat customers. Right? And this is interesting because right, our organizers are talking about like, how, how many of our users came from like, our, our repeat versus new. Because it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about because the strategies that drive new customers are very different for the strategies to drive repeat customers. Right? So you want to account for that. Right? The next level, what we often do is to segment new customers into various things like which target persona you're driving. In this case, we segment according to customer acquisition channels. Right? And this makes sense especially if the people going through each channel experiences a really different part of your product. They come in with different intents and they behave differently. Right? And you want to account for that. For example, we track people coming from Google organic search, people coming from a referral program, people coming from our paid ads. Right? And then this is not enough. So we go deeper. And let's take referral program, for example. So the next step, we want to reverse engineer the key inputs to this program. Right? And the easiest way to do it is to walk through the customer journey of someone going through this. In any one week, there's a certain number of people exposed to the referral program. In this case, this is our checkout success page, right? And out of all these people, some percentage participate in the program, right? They converted, and by participate, it means they actually share, right? And they could go through a few steps to actually share, and they could drop off any steps, so you could account for that, right? And out of everybody who shares, right? Some people share once, some people share three times on multiple social channels, right? So that's another number to pay attention to, this throughput. And out of every share, you get a certain amount of visitors that come through, right? For example, if someone shares through SMS, you get like one visitor. If someone shares through Facebook, you might get 50 visitors, right? So people call this the branching factor. How, how much does one share get you, right? And out of all these people who come to the website, some percentage of them become customers. That's our conversion rate. And these customers spend a certain amount of money per order based on what they buy, based on how many they buy. Right? And if you multiply all these numbers together, you get referral revenue. Right? And you can keep breaking down this down further over and over again, right? any of these numbers. But then we are now at a place where we can choose to go deep into detail and ask targeted questions like, how do we increase conversion rates of not just users, but invited users, right? Maybe you can personalize the website based on the person who invited you, right? And just use the, just leverage that peer pressure, just keep it on your face to make you buy, right? So we can also zoom out. What's useful is it keeps us seeing the big picture. That just, that's just one out of at least six levels you can pull to influence this one number, right? Which is then again, is part of a bigger picture, right? That drives your ultimate number, right? So to do a quick summary, this going through the process of breaking down your North Star metric into its key levers gives us two important things. So it tells us what are the key inputs that drive our growth, not just random things, right? And it forms a foundation for coming up with ideas, right? So you realize when you go through this process, you are already ideating multiple things, like how to do this, how to do this, how to do that, right? Without even thinking that you're ideating or brainstorming, right? And also, you can, you can choose to focus on this detailed level. You can choose to go, oh, maybe you should add a new channel. Maybe you should add a new persona. Right? So it gives you this multi-layered approach to brainstorming. So to show this on a completely different product, right? so Medium, let's use Medium as an example. I don't work at Medium, so this is an outsider's point of view. Right? Right, so Medium. Community for reader and writers. For the, for the benefit of people who don't know what Medium is again, so Medium is a reader and writer platform. So you can go on Medium, you can write articles and publish them, and they look really beautiful, right? And Medium itself is a really strong algorithm that surfaces the best content based on your interest. So people like to go there and read and learn, right? So Medium wants to grow engagement, and you can measure engagement based on how much reading is being done on, in the Medium community, right? So you can start to reverse engineer this number. And the simplest vector is, again, you can influence two numbers, right? Grow the community and grow the amount of reading time per user in the community. So that's the first step of breaking it down. And then you can, again, go through the same process. Right? So you can break down sign user base. How do you grow that? 
new users who sign into the sign up to the community by finding a medium article on Google, right? And people sharing medium articles on their social media channels, that's how you can find medium as well. Right? And then break it down again. So for people finding medium on Google, it depends a lot on how many articles are on medium, right? Because every single article has a chance to be featured in a search. Right? And this times how many articles gives you how many times art medium is shown to you in Google search right, at any one point of time. Right? And based on where it is in the search results, right, there's, a certain, there's a percentage chance that people will click through and see medium. And once you've read the article and you see uh, this little button there to subscribe and get updates from this publication you really like, you can click on it and then you can just sign up for medium. Right? So if you just multiply this, you actually you get this number. And you can actually influence, you, you can talk through design and see which numbers you should influence. Right? So just to open this question to the floor. Right? Looking at this, let's say total articles published. Right, right now you, are, you went from like, aggregate reading time all the way to let's just grow the total number of articles published per week. Right? How, would you, how would you approach this number? Yeah, any ideas? Right. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, so let me just give give my right. We just go through the the little same process, right? And the easiest way to break it down, you can break it down again, right? So total articles published, you can see it's in terms of how many writers are active at any one point of time, multiplied by how frequently they're writing, right? So then again. This is where we can start brainstorming as well. So how do you grow total writers? Right? You can work on the onboarding for writers. Right? Some people have been reading nonstop. Right? They may have blogs outside, their personal blogs. How do you get them to bring their blog onto Medium? Right? So you can design campaigns to entice them on the value of publishing on Medium to build an audience. Right? And create email campaigns right, for people whom you can identify as bloggers. Right? While they are on Medium, you could personalize pop-ups things like that to get them to think about starting, right? right. How, do you go, how do you do writing, writing frequency? Writing frequency is all about, once you start writing, what's the value of writing more and more on Medium, right? Versus some other platform or whatever it is, right? So you could just help them see the value through, say, if you know their job, the reason why they write is this, they want to build an audience. Then you could reverse engineer what features could help them build an audience better, right? It could be better analytics to understand engagement with your content. So it becomes a more useful platform, right? It could be, if you know that people like to write because they like the attention, then you could, you could just look at how to, how to design like the feedback loop when people comment on articles, when people view articles, and then you, you design the notifications that get people feeling really proud of themselves, right? And this can get people to write more. But you realize that we just went from not knowing what the heck Medium is to ideating features really that kind of makes sense, right? So this is a really powerful tool for doing anything in any company, right? So, but now we have a map, but it's, it's not enough. It's like one lens, right? And it sort of brings us back to a better forest for a while. And here's a scenario, a very common scenario, actually. Right? So after you went through something like that with your team members, they have started to talk business value when ideating, right? So team member one says, we should work on improving our conversion rate on checkout, right? People. 56% of people, after they add something to their shopping cart online, they leave. This is unnatural. Who does that at a supermarket, right? So team member two says we should focus on increasing how much people spend per order, right? Because when they study the customer service tickets, people have been asking for various fasts and sweets, right? And we can easily just source that and sell that. So wh what should we work on, right? Because both requires us to change the website. We have one engineer. What should we work on? It might take a month right, if it becomes very complicated. Right? So the, the fundamental way to approach a question like this is to be able to compare these ideas apples to apples, not just think about it as, as individuals. Right? And what this means specifically is, can you, compare, can you determine the estimated impact on your North Star metric of each of these things? And then reverse engineer the cost to create that and then decide which one is more profitable to do now, given your limited resources. Right? And what we do at Better Forest, 
we built a predictive model right, to be able to do exactly that. Right? And here's what it looks like. People hate Excel. Many people hate Excel. I, I love Excel. So, all right, so what we do is we took those inputs, reverse engineer all the ones that matter, right? And we plug them into the model, right? So what this looks like is how many people visited us on, say, organic? How many people decide to stay on the site? How many people viewed product, added product to cart, went through all the checkout steps, right? And then converted. And we do this for the various parts of the model. And then we plug in our baseline data through our analytics and connected this to our revenue number. Right? So what you can do right now is you can just tweak one number here, and then you can see the impact of rev on revenue over time. Right? So for example, right, if you believe that you can improve a metric by, you can improve our, our checkout completion rate by 20% because you realize that like, a certain percentage of customers have this problem and you know how to solve the problem, right? And then you could just tweak this and you'll see the effect. You can compare between ideas. And what we often find as a result is that something that has a, say, 2x increase on an input actually has a smaller effect on revenue overall than something else that only has like a 50% increase. Right? And this is very interesting because it removes bias. It keeps, us, it keeps our mind on a model of reality that's often more accurate than what we have in our bias minds. Right? And the reason why that often happens is because the effect on revenue is not just the effect on the metric, it's the effect on that metric times the number of people that's involved in the metric, right? And some metrics, some inputs like retention and virality, over time, they compound, right? If you, if you improve retention, right, people stay longer, they do more things, they buy more products, right? They tend to refer more customers, they tend to do more things that fits into other inputs, right? Versus say you work on one campaign that affects one week, right? Does that make sense? Cool. So I wouldn't go too deep into this. If you have questions, you can ask me later. But what this does for us is not to be super precise, accurate, but to give us a really high level direction for how to make data informed decisions. Right? And speaking of direction, very often we set goals without a clear path to hit those goals. Right? And that's often problematic. It keeps, us, it keeps our confidence really shattered when we just start and then, holy crap, it's too big a go. Right, so you realize that with those tools that you went through, it gives you what you need to map a realistic path to that goal. Right? Here's what I can show you. So let's say we double, double revenue by January 2018. Right? We set a specific goal that we can measure that's time bound. Right? So the question we ask ourselves now is, what are some possible scenarios you can, we can take to get here from where we are right now, right? So what we do is to go back to our map, right? And out, as one tool out of many, go into our user research to validate parts of the map, use the model to see the impact of, of inputs, right? And then we come up with these scenarios, right? So if we grow reference revenue by 100%, which we know because we have a, ref a revenue program that a lot of people see, but we haven't touched in ages, Right? And we believe we can, we can probably we can do a lot here. If we know that we have an advertising channel that's at least as big as the ones that we have already made work, that we are not touching, right? we can at least double our paid acquisition revenue. If we know that retention is pretty shit right now, so we can work on that. If all these things come true and everything else stays the same, we can realistically get this number. Right? So what we do is we map a predictable path right? with your inputs as the first step. So now that we're closer to reality, the next step then is to figure out what strategies you want to take to grow this specific number, right? And this really depends on your company or your product, right? And speaking of strategies, it often just starts with research, right? Deeper research. And in this part, I just like to go through a little bit on a few simple experiments that Better for us, ran, right? Just to show you what kind, what kinds of strategy, like, tactics we could run to grow. So, who has seen graphs like this before? People, people know what, what a graph like this means, right? It's a uh, right, for the benefit of those who don't really do analytics that much. This is a funnel diagram, right? So, what this tells me is that out of all the people who see this step, 
right? So this, this are basically steps through the product. Right? People do action one, action two, action three. Right? Out of all the people who did action one, only this amount of people did action two, right? and then this amount of people did action three. Right? So this is basically the drop off of people. This is the inefficiency in your funnel. Right? And people call this a leaky bucket. Because basically, imagine if you, 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 you get a bucket of water, and then you walk home. Right? It's full. By the time you reach home, only one quarter of the water is left. So you just wasted all your effort getting the water. Right? So the same thing. You, get, you, wait, you take all this effort to acquire customers, and only a certain percentage of them become actual customers. Right? So, pretty simple as that. But the thing about this is we noticed an unnatural drop-off from here to here. Because we didn't expect people to really drop off at this page at all. So, these are actually pages on our website. And that page happens to be our, the page where people write a message, a short message for the person they are sending flowers to. Right? And if they didn't want to write a message, they can just leave. Uh, they can just skip it. Right? Press next. So I didn't think this was a problem. I thought it was curious. And until the day when we had a couple of people reach our office. Right? And this, this guy used my laptop to make a purchase. And he actually got stuck on this page for 10 minutes. He was like wondering, how do I write a romantic message for my wife? I don't know. <laughs> he was asking me for ideas. It's like, then I come out with some cheesy ideas for him. And then he's like, damn, damn bad. I don't want <laughs> So he got stuck for 10 minutes, right? And then at the end of 10 minutes, he got distracted. And he got up and started talking to someone else. Right? So this is actually quite reflective of what could happen in real life. Right? Not, just, not real life, but like if he was in his house or at his own office, right? The longer someone gets distracted, the more likely someone is to stop, stop buying and and the more likely the person is to decide later on, maybe he doesn't need to buy flowers, or maybe he can buy for someone else. Right? So we didn't want to just take this data point, this single data point as, uh, as gospel. So we went back and did some qualitative research, which is really important for finding causality. Right? So what the goal here is, is to uncover what's causing the problem with that target input, that metric, that two final steps. Right? Why are people dropping off? Right? And we, want, we are very focused on this, not just the entire thing. Right? So what we want to do is to study actual users who recently exhibited that behavior. Not just random people we go to Starbucks to use a test. Because the context, those people at Starbucks, will be really different from the people who actually did drop off. You won't know the difference. Right? So through our data, because we collect emails beforehand, we can reach into our database and pull out all those people who dropped off on this step in the past three days. And then I just send them an email and asking them basically like, why? <laughs> why you drop off? Right? And then they will reply and we synthesize our data. So a really useful way to synthesize this, there are many different ways to do it, right? Is to do it by frequency. Right? So we notice there are many different reasons, not just that. But in the, we kind of validated our assumption that the biggest reason is not sure what to write. Right? And the, the good thing about frequency is that now you know that if you manage to completely remove the reason, not sure what to write, you can save maybe up to half the people who would have dropped off. And that's just a way to estimate the impact of, should I work on this problem, should I work on that problem? Some people actually add, if they do deeper research, they can add a level of intensity, like this person said, I'm really pissed with this thing, right? So you have two different levels, but in this case, you can keep it simple, just look at frequency, right? So we decided to do a really simple experiment that we built in the day, right? So we added a button that when people click, right, we put in cheesy lines, like funny lines, romantic, like weird, retarded, whatever it is, right? So we, we put in like 30 lines and people can just click, click, click until they see the one they want, right? So the impact of this on our conversion rates, we grew it by 11% throughout the funnel, right? Just simple as that, just one day of going through research and the email didn't even take that much time, right? So, what I really want to show you is that it's, it's, not the, it's, not to, it's not that that tactic will work for your company, but the process of identifying, like, oh, here, here are the things I can look at in terms of the, the, the map, right? And then, oh, here, here's the opportunity, and how to determine causality for why the opportunity exists, and from there, figure out a solution. So I'd like to end off with another experiment. So if you remember our referral program from the Bell Forest, this little referral program says, get your next bouquet free, right? And all you have to do is to share your $15 off gift card with your friends. And when two friends buy, 
you get your next bouquet free, right? It's completely free bouquet. And all you have to do is share on Facebook or just share a discount link, yeah? It's like, okay, okay. so our analytics showed that our referral program was complete crap. It's like ridiculously crap. Of all these people who reached our landing page, less than 10% of them decided to actually refer. So people are actually see, like, okay, maybe I'm interested in this and they, they don't follow through. So like, what the heck is going on, yeah? So we did the same thing. We looked into people who saw the referral landing page and then didn't refer. Right? So these are what we call the marginal users that we are trying to get but we lost. Right? So we did the same thing, we, we sent the email to those people. But in this case, we also added something else, which is a live chat, real simple. So this, this is Zendesk chat. And we trigger this pop-up with an automated message that asks, that tries to engage the person when it's on the referral program. And just to see if, are there any usability issues? Are, do people have questions that they, they want to ask but don't, get, but don't get answered on the referral program? They're stopping them from doing it, right? And so that's really helpful. Uh, we, so we, we, we get a whole new range of problems that stop people from referring. And it could be, I, I actually already shared through other means. I don't need your, like, I forgot, whatever. Right? So seen as a, I don't want to be seen as a discount hunter. I don't, I don't know who to share with. But the biggest reason, it's not worth it. Like what, it's too much effort. And it kind of makes sense. Because when you think about it, how many people in your life right now wants to buy flowers? It's very hard to think, right? It's not Valentine's Day, it's not Mother's Day. You, you, don't, know, you don't know when your friends' anniversaries with their girlfriends are. So it's very hard to just go, hey, buy, buy, help me buy flowers so I can get free bouquet. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do, right? So we decided to change it. And so we formed a hypothesis that we could vastly reduce what you call this activation energy to refer by not, not re rewarding people when they succeed in, re in getting some to buy, but we drop the reward by a lot and then, ref and then reward them when they do the act of sharing, right? So this is the principle of instant gratification. You just need to do it you get straight away, right? So now all you need to do is share it on Facebook. You get $20 credit straight away, right? And then you get another $10 for each friend that buys, right? So, so this was, it's still quite shit right now, but then we managed to double our referral rate and our referral revenue as a, as a result, right? So just to show you the process going through it again, how adaptable it is to many, many different problems that we see. Okay. Did you have to confirm your margins and make sure like that $20 is not going to affect that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so we have to measure that it's accretive on, on that, right? So if you, just go, if you just looked at things like this, so we know our, our, what we call a unique economics. We know the cost of a bouquet. So we know how many people come through ref referrals. We know how many people get their additional $20 credit. So we can map out how much money we are giving out, how much people are coming in. Right? As long as we stay kind of like steady, we don't, we don't kill ourselves, and we are growing as a result. So that's, that's a win. Right? All right. So to conclude, th this is what we went through. Right? So the first thing, identify a North Star metric. Right. M many companies actually have, many, have different metrics for different departments, but it's usually quite useful to be able to have everyone aligned to something important. Right? And then reverse engineer your key levers to drive it, like map out those inputs. And you want to quantify your inputs in order to be able to get your baseline for how to estimate impact here. Yeah? And then use that to map a realistic path to success, and then focus your experiments. All right, that's that. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Awesome sharing. Yep. Uh, so we'll open the floor for Q and A. Yep. If anyone has any questions to ask, any predictions to make, flowers to buy. <laughs> <laughs> so the numbers you get is primarily from Google Analytics. Yes. Yeah, so did you put all the tags in on that? All those tags, eh? Yeah. Yeah, so they are from Google Analytics. We also use another software called like Amplitude, but not, not as much as we use Google Analytics because you have far more like, built-in capabilities with GA for a site like ours. Yeah. But then when it comes to tracking things like retention, like, whether someone does certain events, like, other apps are more useful than GA. 
people tend to install something like, uh, like an event tracking tool. Like yeah. Events are actions, right? Like segments, and then you just try all the various analytics software and you see one that fits. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to know after uh, you guys failed to deliver some orders on Valentine's Day, what did you have to do as uh, chief of product and growth to win back uh, yeah. your customers? Good question. All right, so like, some of you might have seen the, that happening, and it was uh, it's quite an experience. So after Valentine's Day, I, if any of you have like, actually bought from us, so for context, we took too many orders on Valentine's Day, actually 20x what we thought we would do. Right? And that was a very big mistake because we actually overreached and thought we could fulfill that. Right? And we couldn't, so we were late for many orders. Right? And uh, flowers, sometimes they got, they got squished because our couriers were also over, overclocked, per se. Normally it's not like that, but Valentine's Day we actually overreached. Right? So if any of you actually experienced that, and if somehow we actually, we actually went through a really uh, an intense recovery process, and if you didn't experience that, just let me know. I'm happy to do something for you, all right? And so, what we did after the, that day is everyone stayed in the office, right, for the, for the entire week doing nothing but customer service. So we called all customers personally. We apologized and we like, refund, like, make up bouquet, even, even if it didn't, even if it's like, okay, we, we send you a new bouquet, right? So second chance to surprise your, your Valentine, right? So like, on Valentine's Day, you send bouquet. It's not really a surprise. Right? <laughs> you, send, you send it a week later, it's kind of a surprise. Right? So, it's, yeah, so we, we just try to do our best to, to make up for it. And it, I mean, it's not easy because Valentine's Day is, is a special day. And it's not just, yeah, I give you, I give you free, free stuff equals I make up for it. Because maybe the moment was ruined. Right? But then we just do our best to, to show that as authentically as possible to, those, to all our customers who trusted us for that, that uh, we are really sorry and want to do whatever it takes to make it right for you. Right? And based on each customer, we, we, we did our best to do it right. Yeah. And so I realized that's not very chief product office or it's not data driven or whatever it is. Right? So it's, it's really just, at, when at times like this, you just, you just go down into the business and just sit down there yeah, and just call. The whole team was calling. Yeah. Did, did you guys get back to uh, finish to get back so at least? Yeah, in fact, there were a lot of people who were really nice about it, even though we screwed up Valentine's Day. Okay. They were like, hey, I understand. And then, and then they told us, actually, a bunch of other flower companies also screwed up. You see, I saw the news. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> You're not the only ones, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not the right thing to think about, right? So, yeah, and pe people say they understand, and all they really wanted to, to know that is that we are trying to make up for it. Yeah. Sorry? What would you do to stop happening again? Stop it happening again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are, there are multiple processes where they put in place, right? So the, the reason why that happened, if we, if we reverse engine or what, like that, is because right, we had a certain amount of resources in terms of florists, couriers, things like that, right? They are stable and really strong. So those could fulfill, say, 500 orders in a week, right? Confidently, all on time, everything amazing, right? And on Valentine's Day, in one day itself, we did 2,000 plus orders, right? So basically what we did is, because we, we had a flexible process to hire new couriers, basically we, we, were, just, we were hiring new couriers on the spot, and we were, we were also running an algorithm to optimize routes, right? So we thought that we could stretch it. We thought that, oh, okay, cool, 2,000, so all we need to do is hire three more couriers to, to, to hit 2,000. But it wasn't as simple as that, right? So given the lesson, for future high volume days, we in advance we will be monitoring like what's our max already, and we're just going to stop it. Yeah, we're just going to stop it because the customer experience is more important. Just like a, a bit more money. Yeah. Yeah, just put a cap on it. Yeah. Or you could funnel them to another journey. Yeah. What What do you suggest? Well, like what Amazon now is. Uh, uh, managing right, they're they're putting slots on it, and they're kind of like letting you uh, select a different time and date instead. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we have roughly we have like four time slots in the day, mm -hmm. so we have order caps for each time slot. Right. So previously, we didn't have it, so that's one of the fixes. So you, that that makes a lot of sense. Right. 
we, like, we have like 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6. And we didn't have a cap, but now we do. So once night, we know that we have, say, three careers for morning time slot. The moment we grew past that limit, the time slot disappears. So you can't book that anymore. So that's how we funnel. Valentine's Day orders? Yeah, to see if you guys made up for, for it. Made up for it? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. In terms of recovery. So, the, the average, um, you definitely not, okay, so because we don't actually have a control group to know what the impact of making up is, right? So, what we could do is just look at Valentine's Day retention versus like normal retention if someone's first order was on, is in May, right? And it would obviously be worse than the, than the typical order and someone who didn't experience Valentine's Day, right? And so on average, people, our customers, they buy maybe like three to five times. Like, good, like the people who are really into flowers, they buy it three to five times a year, right? So some people buy one to, three, one to two times. It really depends on the kind of persona and also sometimes how you acquired them, right? But, this, this, and, but that's like correlation. So we realize that there are people who buy, like people who buy for things like birthdays, get well soon, things like that. Right? So not like really event, really uh, fixed event driven things like uh, anniversary of Valentine's Day. So those people somehow they, they buy much, much more often because they, they have more triggers over a year to buy flowers and they tend to prefer flowers over other gifts. Right? So these this people, their retention is much higher. Right? For people who buy on set dates, very often they, like they, their max is like three times a year. Right? So when we look at this and then we can, we can compare like if we acquire more of a certain kind of user, we'll get higher retention versus another. And then based on certain events, like we did really well for a certain week of something, or we, or we run a really nice campaign where we're giving out flowers, and then people, people have an extra strong impression of our brand, the retention tends to go accordingly. Yeah. It's, it's not easy to attribute cause that, like this cost retention, but we can attribute like this cost, I love your brand, and then that cost retention. Okay, so. so what do you think about metrics that is hard to measure? Say for example, let's say for example the rifle program. So um, what you showed us is uh, something that you share through social media. So you can actually track like, the matrix that is uh, click through and all this. But what about word of mouth? Like I like, say for example, if I buy the uh, bouquet from you guys, and I uh, have another friend that say, hey, um, you know, anywhere that I can buy good flowers. So, I would recommend word of mouth. So how do you capture matrices like this that is hard to measure? So this is one example. And another one is that uh, because your North Star matrix is revenue, right? But what about people who say, for example, um, you know, buy like three, two months later, uh, come back, right? Like how do you capture this revenue, the effect on the revenue that is happening like one month later or two months later? Because for me, I don't buy flowers for my girlfriend like every week. So how do you actually Kind of matrix that okay, so from what I understand, you have two main questions, right? The first question is, there are some, there are some things happening in the world that is not really captured digitally. As a result, you can't actually measure it properly, like how people normally measure. Then the second question is, how do you, how do you track retention for single users and its impact on revenue? Sorry? Okay. And I, I'm guessing you're asking in relation to that, that Excel sheet. Uh, is, is that right, or some, or just or another context, or just tracking in general? In in general, in general. say for example, you have a campaign, yeah, and you measure revenue, right? yeah. Um, but some rabbits, a lot of a big part of source of revenue may be something that is hard to measure through like a single user journey. Yeah. Say for example, if you say for example, if you push recommendation, and then for example, if you push like a very expensive bus, and then I just buy on the house. And when I receive it, I regretted it. I'm like, okay, I'm never buying it again. Yeah. Because I, I, I make this very bad buying decision. So this is actually, you know, it's lost revenue, but you, you, you guys will be, you'll be very hard to discover if you didn't really ask the person, like, hey, why you didn't come back after that. Mm. So, so how do you capture things like that? Yes, okay. So I, I see the pattern here, which is that like, a lot of these like quali quality, some part of are qualitative feedback, like actual things happening that's not, that we don't actually track on Google Analytics, for instance, or Mixpanel, or whatever it is you use, right? So for, for word of mouth, 
unfortunately, it's quite hard to track, right? So we don't, we have no, we have nothing set really set up to track word of mouth. Then the the closest metric to track that is actually direct and organic branded traffic. So people actually coming to our site, new customers that come to our site, even though they have never actually interacted with any other paid channels before, right? So. And we, we can track this by separating new customers from old customers based on the based because we kind of like cookie the browser, so we know if someone has been to our site before and has bought, right? So, based on how many visitors and, and, and then customers that has not bought before, what and that came through direct channels. That means they type in a bear forest into the into the browser and search a bear forest on Google. We can track are we growing in terms of word of mouth. Or other or other ways, or just like seeing an ad and then later converting, right? So it's it's really hard to just segment the word of mouth. And the the other way to come with a leading indicator of word of mouth is uh, what you call a net promoter score survey, right? So they call it NPS survey. NPS survey basically we send it to customers and we ask them the question: How likely are you to recommend a friend? And then people choose one to ten, right? So this is is two parts. One is how how much they love our service, and when it comes when it comes to word of mouth. How likely are they to do it? Is there anything blocking, right? So we, we measure that. And once they click the number, they actually give us some feedback, like why do you give us number 10? Why do you give us seven? Why not 10? Things like that, right? And then we get, we get uh, a, a lot of qualitative results based on that. And we, we focus on growing our number. And our ops team is actually focused on growing MPS, right? Keep, M keep growing MPS over time, which means that everyone focuses on customer success, right? So, and that, that's basically our ops, correct? Like sub North Star metric, MPS, right? So, when it comes to retention, right? so how do you measure retention? So, we, I think there are a few couple parts to this question, like how, how do you visualize retention, right? and, and how do you measure it? So, how do, how do you, how we think about retention? We, we look at it actually quite typically. So, uh, many companies, they use what I call like cohort analysis. Right? So, a cohort analysis basically just takes cohorts of users, and cohorts really depend on how you choose to group them. So, the, the most typical way to do it is to group them based on when they first became customers, right? So let's say week one, someone becomes a customer, then you can track over, say, a year, two years, right? And you can see over the next one week, two week, three week, or month, or quarter, right? How many of them actually came back to buy? And because you track by cohort, you're not mixing this up with people who bought like today, right? You're keeping the core of people who bought last year as an isolated segment. So you can see how they're retaining over time, right? And then we'll compare uh, set cohort number one, which is last year, all the way to cohort uh, number 20, and see if we are improving over time. Right? And then we segment this based on like, short term, mid term, long term. Like, can we get someone to buy again in three months? Right? If we notice that our three month number go keep going down, right, then maybe people are not happy. If we notice that they are stagnant, right, so how, how, do we, how do we make it better? Can we improve our marketing to, to like, create more use cases for, for gifting, for example, or just be there when they want it? Right? And, and then that's how we track it. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, is it? Well, I think the other way to see it is, is it necessary to track a metric? Like, how much impact does it make to your bottom line? Yeah. Is it worth the effort? Yes. Uh, to, uh, the connection. Uh, is it worth putting any of them to see whether the way they have a connection uh, you know, might be the same postal area or might do something in common or might come from the same school or whatever? Is it worth doing any research into connecting people? Because what people plan and what plan and connections are going to do? And would you expect that connection to the store that maybe that's just too expensive? Okay, so to understand, to make sure I understand your question. It's, quite, it's actually interesting. So you are pro you're actually proposing an, an idea which is, right, if you could create a solution that helps us connect, helps us figure out the relationships between people or actually build, help people build relationships between when, they, when the relationships didn't exist, but they had maybe second degree connections. Mm -hmm. If you can connect people together, right, firstly, we'll get a better idea of someone's social circle. Secondly, we know, when we know relationships, we can start telling people, hey, this guy's birth birthday is coming. Right, so maybe we could get something with this guy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so we, that's a question I've never considered. So it's like really interesting. And, right? So I'll, I'll say it's actually useful, but it, it'd be useful to the, to the level of like how, 
how deep that data goes and what kinds of relationships, right? Uh, so, the, what's, the, what's the potential yeah. Of yeah. So in this case, there are the, the way you think about this, right? This, there's one part of it which is what exactly is the solution, and then anyway, you go in, and then once you know is that you know how the solution will impact various key inputs, right, on your model. For example, I can see impacting a few inputs based on how we design it. The first way is through acquisition, right? So someone is not a customer, but maybe someone is a, is a he gave you an email, right? And through this email, you found this LinkedIn profile, and you realize that these are all colleagues in the, in the, in the company. And then, tr and then your LinkedIn profile links to Facebook, and you can, you can determine, oh, your, your colleague, right, who hides in that corner, actually his birthday is coming, right? So get him something. So it's actually, it's a very powerful way to get that first purchase, right? And this exact mechanism can get you repeat purchases, the exact same thing, right? Just telling people, just telling you that someone you care about, e event is coming. Or maybe someone, someone tweeted something sad on Twitter, <laughs> so maybe you want to do something to share the person out, right? So right, right now, I've, I don't really know how to make that happen, to, to make the connections. But then if you think about how, how to think about the opportunity, you just think about, Right, so if that happens, right, you could you could do like a. There's no real way to be really precise about that. But if you just if you just think that previously someone has. Customers usually only have like say one or two people they buy, for in throughout their entire lifetime. But if you you could expand this to five or six, and at the same conversion rates, right. So you could three x purchases if it works out, right. At the, at the max, right. And then obviously not everyone will participate and not everyone will, will be as influenced by that. So it's not going to be 3x, it'll be at some level less, right? So if you go like, maybe, maybe I, I could 1.5x revenue, 1.3x revenue. And then, so is it worth it to build? Yeah. And then that comes the complexity, right? So like, do we even know how to build it in the first place? And then how long it takes to build? And then we could take that and kind of like map out like, so how much to, uh, development effort it takes and you compare this to the other ideas that you have and see which one it makes sense to build first. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I'm just very curious, like how you really manage your inventory in, uh, in real time, like how you try to stop more to install, let's say for, for the situation of the Valentine, right? actually how do you keep track of it in real time, you use the Excel, or you need an in-house tool, or maybe another technology? Yeah. yeah. Have you heard of Magento? Yeah. Yeah, it's an e-commerce platform, yeah. So that's what we use. And Magento comes built in with some features like that already, right? So. You can set an event. You can you can set that you have fifty of that bouquet in stock, and then once it hits fifty, it takes it off the site. So that's, that's how we track inventory, right? And we could set, um, we could we could plan our inventory based on right, based on how how we understand our, our suppliers are going to change over time, right? If we know that our suppliers have run out have run out of tulips. Two of our supplies are run out of tulips, for, for instance, right? We will, we will limit our tulip bouquets by a lot, just to make sure that people don't exceed it, right? We, the first number we look at is how, how much we have in, right, that's ready right now, not, not, not even just like open the box, right? What, how, many, how much is ready? And then we'll use that as the first number. And then when our, if our suppliers cannot get us, because, and, and, and the reason why we do this is because not all flowers, when they come from a supplier, right, they, they, they open it, not all flowers look as nice. Is the thing, even though it's completely fresh, but right, some some buds might be smashed because they they packed tight together, for instance. So we we don't use flowers that look like that. So we at any one point might use say eighty percent of all the flowers we get, right? And sometimes if the suppliers don't take care, they might give us a box full of crap, right? So we have to take into account this risk, and and then so we only look at like, how much ready do we have in our fridge at any one point of time, and use and use that to track. Yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> let me let me know let me know if I if I if I if I answer a diff, completely different question. So you you asked me like how do we track our inventory, right? Yeah. Mostly yeah. In real time, how 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 we close to real time? Or how close to real time? Yeah. How close to real time we track our inventory? Oh, so this is it's not an Excel sheet. It's it's all it's all in Magento. So if someone buys like bouquet A, right, then our it automatically re reduces the number of, uh, like, let's say if we say that we have inventory stock 99, instantly it becomes 98. It's just based on Magento. Yeah. And is that, I mean, the moment we hit zero, it, it disappears off the outside. Yeah. 
<laughs> Just want to check that I answer the correct question. Sweet. One last question. Yeah. Uh, so, in your talk, you mustn't take the conversation forward later with uh, mm -hmm. German. Uh, after <laughs> yeah. our second speaker. Uh, based on your slides, right? Yeah. Most of the time you are doing quantitative data, so you're blasting like emails, etc. So, what is the waiting period? Then, how do you validate the results? So, is it go by you putting, you do some changes, you wait for a few months, then compare, like, let's say six months, six months before then, the differences or how do you do that? Just to make sure I understand the question, right? So. The data we get from blasting emails to ask, right? Do you have any problems with this part of the product, right? That those kinds of emails. So you're asking me how, like, what's the waiting time? That means like, how how long do people take to reply? Is that your question? Yeah. So it's like yeah. the waiting time to get feedback. Yeah. Then think of the design strategy things that you probably can do to make uh, the revenue. Yeah. The conversion so. Based on your statistic of charts itself, so what's the duration that you do comparison? Makes sense. Okay, so there are multiple waiting times. Sorry, it's a it's a process. The first waiting time comes after we send an email, right? So people, it could take maybe three to four days before enough people reply that I have enough. They, I, I usually I, I the, for that for that one I blasted off to six hundred people, and. Like 65 of them replied, roughly. And that was actually enough data for me to get like a, a good idea of how, how many people are feeling a certain thing. Right? And it took about three, four days for them to reply. And then after that, there was some, we, after the, the synthesis of like turning into a pie chart, that's like, that's almost nothing. This is just, it's just a little bit of Excel. Right? And after that, so deciding what to do, creating the, the experiments. Right? So whenever we, whenever we do experiments, like what, what we do is we, 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 we plan it out, right? So our hypothesis, for example, for the, for the referral program is that people, we, we map our hypothesis really clearly. People, people are not doing it because the friction is too high because the reward is not worth the effort, right? So if we make it the reward more worth the effort, right, by using instant gratification, because we believe that right, if someone only gets a reward in God knows how long, because who will want to buy, right? If we change this around, we get a lot more, right? And we, and let's say we, we can put an estimate just based on like uh, a, a guess estimate, right? Well, a, a guess. It's not going to 10x it. It's going to maybe 2x it or 50% incre increment. And then based on this, and then we we map out like how you're going to run it. So what's what's the minimum viable test to do? So in this case, all, all, we didn't have to re redesign the entire UX. If you realize, if you redesign the entire UX, it would have made no difference probably because no one said anything about I don't understand what's going on. Like I, I it's, it's hard to navigate, right? So we so we all we did was change the text on our back end. We, so we use Referral Candy. It's a referral program software. And we just need to tweak a few inputs. And we launched it in less than a day. Right? And then, so when it comes to collecting data and validating, so there's a little bit of like, uh, stats comes into play. And so there's a, there's a few ways to think about it. Right? So we don't accept results until it hits at least 90% statistical significance. Right? And to hit that, we need a certain amount of people who actually went through like the the program at the point of time. Right? If we if we can't do an A B test just due to the nature of the, the situation, we look at pre like pre and post. Right? And this also depends on and when we look at pre and post uh, experiments, there's no we we won't see success if we make very, very small changes like change the button color because there's too much variation. Right? But if you base it on, say, like a, on a psychological input that we believe makes sense, that we believe is a big change, we tend to see really big increments. And it get, basically, it just goes like this, and then it goes like this. Right? And it, if it stays steady, we, we accept the test. Right? Once enough people have gone through, once you have enough people in the post-stage sample and the pre-stage sample that we map out. Right? And usually, this could take about two weeks. One to two weeks, depending on how much the impact is. And this is, this is a little bit of like statistical math, right? So if you, if you make a really small change and the, the change is like a 1%, 2% change, right? You need like a crap ton of people to actually validate your, to, make, to, to, to tell you that your results, right? Is statistically confident, right? But if you create a change that could 2x 
your metric, you need far less people because the, the difference is far bigger, it's far more obvious that there's a difference. Right? So in our case, we, we ignore all, all the like, change button color, change a little bit of texting, we focus on things like that, and as a result, we could like, shrink test dates. And that's a very long-winded answer, so about two weeks, two weeks plus to validate. Yeah, I hope that helped. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. Yep. Hope that was helpful.